good to be with you today. Uh, my name is Pastor Roses, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. I am an Indigenous American of Mayan descent, and I say to you, lend me peace in this time. Certainly, it's a beautiful season that we are in, and if you're visiting us for the first time, I say to you, and whether you're here on campus or online, that you should know that you are welcome, that you are loved, that you are safe, and that God is my peace. It was the summer of 2010. I was living in San Jose, California, working as an associate pastor for a reformed church, and yet sensing this call to return to Los Angeles to plant a church. Yes, you heard me right to start a church, plant a church. This is to say, there is no people, no church building, no ministries, no budgets, no committees, and to start a church was my call. Now, the fascinating part of this uh, was the moment that I would begin to share about my great excitement of starting this new church. I would usually get a couple of responses, one response would be something like this. I guess my sad face. Like, poor Moses, um, he's going to go back to church. Uh, or I would get these kind of comments. Uh, I will be praying for you. Uh, I hope everything works out. Uh, are you sure you want to plant a church? You should just stay in your current position. Some would even try to put things in perspective and would say to me, but if I was you, I wouldn't even plan this thing. Uh, or if I were you, I wouldn't do it because it's too difficult. And then some would even give me statistics and would say, you do know that 80% of church plans fail, right? Such encouraging moments that I experienced. Apparently people didn't have a very positive or encouraging image of church plans. But if I'm honest, if I'm completely honest, the reality is that there were moments that I too would ask myself, what are you doing, Moses? To leave the established and the institutionalized church. Now that is not smart. It's not, it's quite ludicrous if you ask me. It's because the institutionalized church is safe, it's comfortable, it's secure, there's a strong budget, there's a building, there's members already committed to the church. Why go out into the unknown? And so for a moment there, I began to believe their words. I began to believe their thoughts about church plans. And I, it's funny how that works but, and how that happens, but for some reason I began to believe, and I'm not sure if you've experienced anything like this before, where you're commencing a challenge, task, a challenging goal, and it seems like everyone around you is discouraging you before you even start. And so I sort of lost my way, shall we say. And at the beginning, I, I felt certain about my call. I was confident about what God was asking of me. My identity was clear. It was decluttered, shall we say. And yet doubt and fear were creeping in. And only by the power of the Holy Spirit did I come to my senses. I was awakened to my true reality in the in God. I knew that church planting was not my battle because that battle belongs to the Lord. All I have to do is obey God, trust God, rely on God. Now my church plant lasted 12 years. And it was hard work and it was challenging. Prayer did become my weapon. God did win the battle. Many came to Christ. Many were baptized. Many put their trust in Jesus. You see, the point of this story is not so much the outcome. More importantly, in my opinion, it was the fact that I didn't lose my identity in God. And I wonder, how many times did we lose sight of our true identity? I titled today's sermon, When Will We Come to Our Senses? 
Today's wisdom comes from a really well-known parable, and in my opinion, is one of the greatest short stories of all time, because this parable disrupts our understanding of God, of the divine, of the three-in-one. It is quite illogical. Frankly, it is absurd. It challenges our interpretation of the triune God and presents to us an even more expensive view of the Creator. You see, I wonder, is this why Jesus speaks through parables? Because parables do have this profound and poetic, uh, shall we say, capacity to speak to a wide-ranging audience. And certainly, if one reads the context of this parable, one will discover that Jesus is speaking to a diverse group of people. It says that Jesus spoke to tax collectors, to sinners, to Pharisees, to scribes, and a bunch of other people. And certainly, the nature of this parable invites the listener, the reader to identify with one of the three parables. Still, I realize that the parable of the prodigal son makes no mention of daughters, of sisters, of mothers, of wives, or of any other women for that matter. And so to assist everyone with their identification with this parable this morning, especially my sisters in Christ, how about we expand this parable to include a mother of two daughters, or a parent of two children. After all, the point of this parable is to identify with a character in the story. And because of your racial background, your ethnic background, your gender, your world perspective, the stage of life that you're in, what you're going through in this season of life, it will most definitely determine your affinity. This parable consists of three Characters. Firstly, the young sibling who could not wait for the inheritance, who truly was impatient and definitely impulsive, yet receives the inheritance and squanders it. This is the meaning of the word prodigal, by the way. One who spends lavishly, recklessly, and foolishly. And yet scripture says, he comes to his senses. In other translations, it says, he came to himself as though to say he was not living like himself, as though he had become someone else, as though he had lost his true identity. And when he finds himself, he decides to return home to seek forgiveness. And then there's the parent who is filled with compassion upon the arrival of the lost child, receives the child with hugs and kisses, and quickly establishes forgiveness through dressing up the child, shall we say, with a robe, which means honor, with a ring, which means authority, with shoes and sandals, which are signs of freedom, no longer a servant, now a child of the parent was dead and now is alive, was lost and now is found, and the parent celebrates the arrival of the child with a feast, with music and dance. And yet, unknowingly or knowingly, forgets to notify the older child. And that leads me to the final character, the elder son, who is hard at work in the field, arrives to this great celebration and becomes furious, refusing to enter the party because he considers himself better than his sibling, because he has lived a life of obedience and faithfulness, and that means something to him. And here is where I encourage you this morning to open up your heart to open up your mind, to open up your soul as the holy ancient wisdom enters the room. Here is where we invite the Holy Spirit to counsel us, to comfort us, to help us, to guide us, because no matter what you're going through this morning, the Spirit of God is here to guide you, to lead you. This is the moment to be fully present. Because whether you identify with the young sibling, the parent, or the older son is not so important. What truly matters is this. God's grace abounds for all of us. This is to say, everyone is welcome, and yet no one is worthy. 
everyone receives forgiveness, and yet no one deserves it. So God's grace is a gift, freely given, without measure, without restriction. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German Lutheran pastor and theologian, says this about grace. The essence of grace, we suppose, I love this speech, is the account has been paid in advance. And because it has been paid, everything can be had for you now. What if the meaning of this parable is to sit in all three positions? To identify with the younger sibling is to reject the desire to go off to a distant land, away from God, shall we say, attempting to separate ourselves from our true identity, to reject the motive to spend our inheritance, our blessings, recklessly and foolishly, and to identify with this younger sibling is to commit to ourselves to faithful and biblical stewardship of all that we have and all that we are. Still, the younger sibling receives grace. And if you identify with the Father, which by the way, many scholars and theologians rep- believe that it represents God in this parable, but if you were simply to view this character as just merely a human parent, then we would know that a parent would acknowledge the mistakes made along the way with their Parents make mistakes too. You see, the lack of communication by this parent separated the, the siblings, why not notify the elder sibling of the celebration? Why not notify the elder sibling of the arrival of his younger sibling who was lost? Still the parent receives grace. And if you identify with the elder sibling, it is to realize that faithfulness and obedience also comes with a risk. I know many Bible-believing uh, Christians, many church-going people who whose faithfulness and obedience has turned into obligation and duty. Did you hear me? And thus, no longer serving out of love, their life has become a production, a performance. Checking off all the boxes is not a life of love or service. You see, I've seen this way too often in our world, in marriages, when fidelity and love evolve into obligation and duty. In parent-child relationships, when devotion and care become a burden and a chore. In, in, and I've seen this in churches, when ministry and service become all about power, position, and privilege. And I see it in humans when their joy and generosity and the certainty of who they are, certainty of their identity somehow becomes sorrow, scarcity, and loss of one's sense. Oh, I've seen this story way too often, and it saddens me. And I laugh because I don't know what else to do. It saddens me, but I laugh, and sometimes I cry, and then sometimes it bothers me. It bothers me because I just see these lovely, beautiful, poetic things of the world become burdensome, obligatory, dutiful, and sinful. It bothers me to witness hate separation, racism, homophobia, sexism, transphobia, white supremacy, war, death, genocide, and evil in our world. It does bother me. I do lament it. But still I wonder, do those who perpetuate these ills and sins, do they even recognize the blood? Because you have to understand something this morning. I'm, I'm just a pastor. I'm just a pastor. I I see the world through the eyes of a pastor, uh, through the eyes of a preacher, of a priest, of a servant. I spend considerable time of my week praying for people, praying for this world, praying for you in this room. I seek to speak to God. I seek to listen to God. I seek to rely and trust on God. I attempt to look at all things through this Trinitarian lens, through the name of who was and is and is to come. I attempt to see the world through a theological and biblical lens. And so when I witness humans preserving ills, burdens, sins toward other humans, well, that's that's the human attempt to erase the very image of a triune God in someone's face. 
and I lament this to witness this. It troubles me to see this week after week in our world, and we are witnesses to this right now. I mean, if you look at the war in Ukraine, one month in, a man in leadership becomes this madman, a bully, a person in search of power and possession, a lunatic who has bombed hospitals, bombed the historical theater with innocent civilians inside, even after the word children is in huge letters, was placed on the pavement next to that theater. Thousands of civilians dead, millions of refugees displaced, and no signs of backing down. That is the human attempt to erase the very image of the triune God from the faces of the new faith. And recently, Judge Kentandi Brown Jackson, this brilliant, well-rounded Supreme Court nominee who would be the first black woman to serve in such a capacity, this should be celebration and admiration in itself. We have think about this, 150 justices have served on the bench and 108 of those have been white men. It's about time. We see a black woman in the Supreme Court. And yet for three days, some might white men, by the way, attempted to dehumanize her, asking her racist questions that have no bearing on her role. And once again, we see the human attempt to erase the very image of God on her face. What about Leah Thomas? Have you heard of her? This first openly trans athlete to win the NCAA Division I championship. And while many celebrated her, many others attacked her, criticized her. They protested against her in a swim meet. Did you hear me? Stood and protested against a college student. And then a Florida politician signs a proclamation that declares the runner up the rightful champion and winner. Claiming an unfair game. Yet again. You see, when I witness this, what is happening in Ukraine, what has happened this week with Mutanji Brown Jackson and Leah Thomas, I will have to call it out. I have to call it out. It is unbiblical. It is sinful. It is not Trinitarian. You know, Richard Rohr, the Franciscan friar, the search Trinity is and must be our stable, rooted identity that has not come and go, rise or fall. This is the rock of salvation. See, all are made in the image of the triune God. All creation is inherently good. Everything is inherently holy. All are inherently loved. Everything is inherently grace. All creation inherently carries the spirit of the divine within. This is the biblical and theological response to unbiblical statements. And I wonder, what if all these positions, all these characters of this parable, have just lost their way? Had the image of the triune God distorted somehow? What if all three are prodigal? The younger son who deliberately went lost, who callously turned his back on his parents. The father who missed to notify the elder sibling. The elder son whose love has become an obligation. They are all prodigals and still God's grace of God. And perhaps the most helpful approach to this parable for us this morning is to consistently return to the position of God always aware of our brokenness, always aware of our need of grace, for grace cannot be earned, it is freely given and full of joy. Let me say something. You must understand that this parable ends with joy. It ends with celebration, music, dancing, food. We don't want to miss out on the joy because a gospel without joy well, that's not good news at all. And Jesus, because I love how Jesus makes sure to represent or to present God as a God who rejoices, a God who is joyfully welcoming those who are alive and those who are found. This should demonstrate to us the essence of God. 
Jesus willingly died on the cross, chose to give his life, uh, was not forced to do so, but lovingly did so, and takes away our shame, our failures, our mistakes, our transgressions, our attitudes of obligation, duty, task, and takes away our sins, and gives us his forgiveness, his successes, his righteousness, and his grace. And on the third day, he rose again to give us liberation. Liberation for what? You see, I would say it's liberation to lean into our true identity in the body of God. Freeing us to share generously grace with all creation. And freedom to participate in the celebration, in the party, in the music, in the dancing, in the flow that is way bigger than us. Standing in solidarity with the poor, the suffering, the oppressed, the people of Ukraine, with those who are at our American borders this morning, with the lamenting immigrants who are making the journey as we speak, removed from their homes, removed from their lands, standing with black and brown and indigenous communities and lamenting alongside of them with their historical pains and burdens and with the queer community and with the young community who is less and less identifying with God or religion. How do you feel? There is so much to do in this world and to step into this dance into this music, into this flow, is the response of joining our benevolent and Trinitarian God in the healing and reconciling of all creation. You see, there we will find joy. There we will find the cosmic hope for the world. We will find Jesus, who is the apex of the gospel, the final chapter of reality, shall we say. And we do witness the world being put back together. But you know what we also experience? We also experience lament, pain, tears, and suffering. I want to end with some poetry today. From Reverend Sarah Speed, she's an associate pastor of the Presbyterian Church in New York City. And she wrote this poem titled, What Doesn't Play by the Rivers? I come into the room calculating what I've done. As if hurt could be measured, as if there was a score system, as if we could say what I owe in return. I come into the room ready to apologize, ready to make amends, ready to tell you all the things I'll do to make it better, but you put the arm into it. Grace is the ocean that softens the edges. Grace is raining in the desert. You're not sure whether to laugh, to cry, or to dance. Grace is a miracle all by itself. In a score-keeping world, grace doesn't play by the rules. I come into the room calculating what I've done. You say there's grace here. It feels like a miracle. I don't know whether to laugh, cry, or dance. You see, beloved, full to the grim rhythm, is being patient with everything. With everything that is a mystery, with everything that is a paradox, God's grace and God's love for us, it is illogical. It is irrational, absurd. But it is more expensive than we can ever, ever. And that is the gospel that is full to the brim, full of joy. And we step into that flow. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, you step into that flow. And you begin to see the grace. God, the word of life, and we all say together, thanks be to God.